Hi, everyone. Today, we are very excited to be welcoming Dr. David Celeberti on the podcast. He is the executive director of ASAT, which is based in Hoboken, New Jersey. Hi, David. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's good to see you. Can I say how excited I am for you to be on this podcast? So I just want to tell a little story from way back when. So Uh I'm (laughs) at I met Dr. Celebrity probably 20 years ago when I was just getting into the field and I worked in New Jersey for a while and he was like a big wig in the field at the time. And I remember meeting you, you came into our clinic and then I remember meeting you at another conference and you remembered who I was. And I was like, he knows my name. Dr. Celebrity knows my name. And I was just so excited and oh. I'm still fanning over you right now. And oh, thank you. Happy to be here. And do I actually forget names? I don't forget faces. So I'm I'm happy that I remembered your name. Oh, well, you faked it well. Maybe you just said hi. <laughs> I took it as you remembered who I was. No, I think I probably did remember your name. <laughs> it may have been a it may have been a name tag. It but... may have been a lanyard. I, I had I had a prompt. <laughs> well, for the people who may not be fangirling, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about you and and your background? Sure. Um, I started out as a clinical psychologist, and uh, I was um, in that generation where the uh, the BCBA credential was just beginning. Um, so I um, became certified in the year 2000 um, and um, became involved with ASAT a couple of years later, um, first serving as the president, a board member, then the president of the board. And then as we expanded, um, I uh, moved into a very part time executive director role. And now I'm um, a half time executive director of ASAT. And uh, I also have a small um private practice where I provide consultation to schools in rural Maine and some of the, and actually all of the Native American communities uh, in that state. That's the other part of my role, so. That's amazing. And, you know, I was around at a time when ASAT was tiny and it's so exciting to see them grow. But for those of the, for those of people who don't know what ASAT is, we seem to throw out these terminologies and we are acronyms and we don't define them. So what is ASAT? Uh, we're the Association for Science in Autism Treatment, um, and we've been around since um, since 1998. So we just celebrated our 25th anniversary. Yay! Amazing! Thank Congratulations! Yeah. Thank you. And so, what what is ASAP's mission? Like, what are what are you guys here to do? Sure. Well, we um, we promote accurate, scientifically sound information about autism treatment. We um, because there's so much misinformation out there, we spend a lot of time kind of combating unsubstantiated, false information, countering that information. We also um, advocate for the use of scientific methods to to guide treatment choice and treatment evaluation, um, which is why um, the work of behavior analysts really resonates with us because a lot of what we talk about is things like database decision-making and transparency and treatment fidelity, which are all you know, really important principles for behavior analysts. And that's what we hope everyone would um, espouse as providers, regardless of their discipline. Yeah, um, I love the focus on the the science. And I think it's something that we're starting to, you know, maybe lose in recent years is going back to the science and using treatments that have been evidence-based. That I'm wondering from being in the field for so long, what have you seen change with the science, you know, over the last 20 years have been some of the significant changes? Yeah, um, you, you know, um, th- th- there's a saying, the more things change, the more things stay the same. So, you know, it, when I look back, you know, at, at when ASAP started, there was a lot of misinformation and there were a lot of um, pseudoscientific interventions um, like psychoanalytic play therapy, which was really basically trying to undo the damage that was caused by a cold aloof parent um, who caused their child to withdraw into the shell of autism. Um, We had organizations like um, CAN and DAN uh, which um, which started, I think I wrote down the years actually in the mid '90s, and they um, and, and they stood for things like cure autism now, defeat autism now. They were acronyms, and at the time, uh, parents were led to believe that through a variety of of um, approaches using CAM, like complementary alternative medicine, um, you know supplements, what have you, that their child could be cured of autism. 
Um, so, you no, know, there always had been pseudoscience or always had been sort of the false promise that with this particular intervention, your child can be cured of their autism. Uh, so now when we fast forward, um, we're looking at, um, in some ways, like a much smaller world in that the internet has really um, made it easy for a mom in, in England to connect with a mom in Phoenix about you know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and get, you know, a link for where she could purchase such a unit. And, um, you know, that was certainly not the case uh, 25 years ago. Um, but, you know, the world is smaller and the number of pseudoscientific interventions have, have really skyrocketed. Um, there are literally over 500 treatments for autism, which is absolutely staggering and really heartbreaking that parents have to work so hard just to figure out how to help their kid. Like I often use the analogy um, that um, imagine we were talking about a kid with cancer and a parent had to sift through 500 treatments to figure out how to help their child with cancer. It's heartbreaking, you know, and I think what, what um, the founders of ASAT were um, fueled by was this notion that parents should not have to work so hard just to figure out how to help their kid. You know that that the, the road to effective treatment should be clear, um, and um, and without barrier, and and filled with accuracy and high quality information. But you know, in answer in answer to your question, you know, in terms of what's changed, you know, I actually wrote down a couple of things that you know that I wanted to share. You know, one of the one of the problems that we have now is that um, it's getting easy for people to claim that they're evidence based. And sometimes in task force reports, um, and I'll just use the example of music therapy. So music therapy by one of the recent task forces is now considered to be evidence-based, based essentially on three studies that really have little to do with each other. So like in behavior analysis, we're proud of how conceptually systematic our work is, but that body of research is not conceptually systematic. It doesn't include replication. Um, you know, I, I don't, I didn't formally check to see whether the authors, if there were conflicts of interest, but it's a very small body of research. So now what's happening is that at the table of evidence-based practice, you have a lot of newcomers that are um, letting consumers believe that all scientifically validated treatments are equivalent in their strength. And that's couldn't be further from the truth. So that's a really big challenge that we face. And one of the things that ASAT wants to do now is really try to convey that, um, that scientific support is a continuous variable and not a dichotomous variable. Like you either have support or you don't have support, but what is the level of support? Uh, and, um, and, and are you getting what the research says is effective? So, you know, you could very well have a music therapist who is teaching a child to play the violin and calling it therapeutic. And that has nothing to do with the studies that were published, but consumers are kind of led to believe that it's effective. Um, we have a couple of other uh, challenges going on right now. Um, you know, the, um, we, have, we still have disparities um, in, in who's accessing treatment, like children of color, people in rural communities, uh, people in Native American communities, uh, people outside the United States, uh, folks who are not English speaking, are not accessing the very best of what we know. Um, we have um, uh, a high demand for providers um, and um, to some extent a low supply, particularly when we're talking about adult services. Um, there's a real dearth of providers. And um, we have, um, uh, you know, other challenges right now where, you know, there are some people who are advocates, um, you know, maybe they um, have been diagnosed later in life who are, you know, speaking with a really broad brush about autism treatment and, and really making it hard for moms and dads who are just trying to help their kids. Um, you know, sometimes it gets to the level of almost like online bullying where they're accused of not loving their child or not accepting their child for who she, who or she is. And um, that's heartbreaking. You know, there's a parent who has a child who's self-injurious, who might not be toil trained, who's bolting in the street. Um, and you're, you lie awake at night, really afraid for your child's safety 
and you're told that just love your kid, you know, don't don't change your child. So there, there's a lot that's that's really kind of going on right now that is um that's tough. You know, I was gonna I'm actually sure. ask you about that because it seems like what you described as like one side of the pendulum in the in the nineties, early two thousands, which was cure autism, treat autism, you know, change yeah. my child, has now swung to how dare you think it needs to be cured? How dare you think it needs to be treated? Yeah. And we're kind of at the opposite extreme. And what can we do as a community to better bring it back to the science? Because I think there's still so much out there that's not scientific, which is what all the parents are talking about. No, just love your child and everything will go away. And it's just a phase. And, and ABA is not, you know, ABA is forcing your kid to do things. And how can we as a community, um, you know, help these families who are not getting what they need? Yeah, you know, I, I um, are you talking about as a behavioral analytic community or as a community in general? Because I think the answer might be a little bit different. Let's do both. Let's do both. Okay, yeah. so um, you know, I think um, you know, there's so much happening in the field right now in terms of um, compassion and um, you know, social validity, um, as if that's a new concept. Uh, even notions of consent. And I think a lot of young behavior analysts are sort of of the opinion that um, everything that we've done in the past was wrong and that all these discussions are new. And I think it's really important that we, as behavior analysts, kind of celebrate that um, our work has already been forged on the anvil of compassion, that you know our focus on evidence-based, I'll just kind of go through a couple of things. And, and I think all of them, show compassion, the fact that, you know, we rely on, on evidence-based interventions, that we, um, we individualize interventions at every level, you know, um, that we um, conceptualize our goals um, carefully with, um, you know, including parents, you know, some behavior analysts do a much better job. Um, we're learning how we can better um, incorporate the, the views of our kids, um, you know, Keeping in mind, I mean, there's a lot of talk about assent, but um, we're still learning how do you garner assent from a child who's nonverbal, you know, and, um, you know, we have been engaging um, our consumers as partners for 25, you know, 30, 40 years. We've always done that. We should be proud of that, particularly at the time, you know, our psychoanalytic counterparts were blaming parents and we were always like, bringing parents into the the driver's seat with us and, and saying like, you know, hop in, buckle up, we're, we're, you know, we need your help. And if anything, you know, we could be accused of putting too much pressure on parents. We could be accused of overusing our lingo and, and making it hard for parents to really understand what we're asking of them. We could be accused of not listening as well as we can, but we've always valued parents. We've always valued, um, not always, but for a long time, we've also appreciated the roles that siblings can play. Um, and we've always had uh, a commitment to transparency that we're not, you know, that we spell out what we do in writing. We, we detail it all out. Um, for many, many years, starting with like the seminal work of Ted Carr, we've looked at like the underlying functions of behavior. We, we've thought of behavior as um, it's adaptive for the kid. You know, and, and we should be proud of that. We've been talking about that for decades that, you know, we call it maladaptive in some circles, but for Johnny, it's completely adaptive. It's, it's his tools. He doesn't talk. And this is how he talks to us. It's how he tells us that he doesn't want to do this or he wants something. And we have to, you know, work on giving him the communication so he can do that. And we've always relied on, on data to guide our decision-making. So there's so much that we could be proud of as behavior analysts. And I think that part of how to move forward is not, it is of course we could look back and say, we didn't always do a great job teaching manding, or we might've over relied on discrete trial instruction. But all the things I just mentioned are things that have been in place for a long time and we should be proud of it. And I think it's the foundation in which we can move forward is to, to remember those things and be proud of those things. But, you know, there are things that we can do better at. Like, I, I think um, we could be better at communication uh, with our colleagues, uh, um, with our clients, um, you know, in terms of, uh, I remember reading one time, like, 
a, a recommendation, bombard your child with a continuous schedule of contingent reinforcement. And it sounded like a military maneuver, right? It, it sounded so harsh. And as opposed to like, you know, reinforce your child when he speaks to you, you know, in, in great abundance, you know, and very enthusiastically. He's so and then, smile yeah, a lot. Yeah. 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 So, I, you know, I think, um, and you know, it's hard because the, the folks that really need that the most are probably the younger professionals who are just spent a time like passing the BCBA exam and memorizing the definitions of, you know, EOs. And now they're having to talk to, you know, parents like, you know, in, in lay language. And that's really hard. And I think that's part of the problem. We also have to do a better job playing nicely in the sandbox with people from other disciplines. Even if they use interventions that, that you know, make us, you know, want to roll our eyes, but we, we have to show respect and we have to see if, you know, the, it's interesting because we talk about pairing, we have to pair with our colleagues too. Yeah. No, they can't see us as a judgy finger pointing, like, you know, you're using brushing. There's no, there's no science behind that, but instead, you know, how could we look at that in a way that we can collect some information to see whether or not it's really working? Um, are you open to that? Like, that's a much better conversation we're having with colleagues. So I think that, you know, there's a lot that we could do as behavior analysts um, to, to sort of make things a little bit better for our consumers um, who are trying to pursue science. But it's hard. Society's changed. And, you know, there's, there's really not a respect for science now. And, um, and maybe it's always been there. But now that disrespect for science is is right there in front of us all the time. You know, which I think, the, I think the young people, you know, getting into this field who have even been in the field for five years need to hear that message because what you're saying is we don't have to cancel the last 20 years of behavior analysis. It wasn't that we were doing everything wrong. We're really just continuing to build and grow and evolve, which is really something to be proud of. We're not starting from scratch now that somebody pointed out that, you know, maybe one time we could have done better. But really, if you're getting into the field now, know that like, you know, you guys did all the hard work and all the heavy lifting that we're now building on top of. And if we look at it that way, that we can continue to do better, it's really because of the people who are there, you know, doing that 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, I, I often say like, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of the people that stood before that worked before us. And and I I worry that some of our younger professionals forget that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, trying to knock them down is not going to give us yeah. better foundation. Yeah, and you know th what we're seeing now with some of the 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 new developments in ABA is that there's always this um, tendency for some people to want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Totally. And we and I remember twenty five years ago we saw that when even verbal behavior came on board that um, you know it was. Families were actually thinking that everything that I've done, like even like my toil training efforts, everything has to change. And now we have to shift gears completely. We saw that to some extent when fluency became, you know, fluency based instruction became popular. So every time something new happens in the field, um, there are some people in our field that think it's like a paradigm shift. As opposed to like, you know, ASAP thinks about science as incremental and we should be thinking about it as, you know, we're doing better than yesterday and we're going to do better tomorrow than we did today. But that really comes from the tapestry of our work and not just like these uh, epiphanies that happen. Like, you know, yeah. autism treatment is not like uh, something where someone discovers something in, in, in a lab and then all of a sudden everything changes. It's really um, something that, that is cumulative. An evolution, right? And, you know, yeah. I'm, often, I'm often seeing people say, oh, well, you know, this treatment that you put in place yesterday, I tried it once, it's not working. Well, let me go to TikTok and see what TikTok has to say about this, right? <laughs> and that's a real danger of what's happening yeah. today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and that, that's, um, that's a problem because uh, then, you know, as, as behavior analysts, we're like in a quandary of when you say it didn't work, it's kind of a little bit like um, a prescription from a pharmacist. Like, did you fill the prescription? Did you take it as per the schedule? Um, you know, uh, 
or and maybe you did all that. And we have to go back to the drawing board. Maybe it was the wrong prescription, but it's hard. With, you know, as behavior analysts, we have to figure that all out mm -hmm. without you know making the clients feel like we're like you know trying to put it back on them. You know, so it's like tell me what you did, and then like and and how and how does that you have to think about how that is similar or different from what you recommended. So it's tough. Yeah. So what are the, some of the things that ASAT is doing to, you know, spread the word or spread the science? Sure. Well, we um, we have uh, a newsletter that we publish, uh, Science and Autism Treatment. Um, in fact, um, we can share with the viewers a link to our March issue, which came out um, at the beginning of the month. It was a double issue. It was on behavior analysis, actually. And we had great articles. Um, we had, you know, what... Um, how does ASAT support the work of behavior analysts, both in terms of the discipline, uh, you as a provider and your clients, um, how uh, we had a treatment summary on behavior analysis to help people appreciate that it's, um, it's more of an overarching intervention, um, a system of interventions and not a specific intervention. So we thought it was important for consumers to appreciate, um, you know, uh, that because we also publish things on like chelation, you know, which is not the same kind of intervention as applied behavior analysis. Um, we have uh, an article on basically all the articles we have on the ASAT site that a behavior analyst might be interested in. So it's kind of like a, a, a an inventory or collection and we try to break it up so it's kind of like a one-stop shopping. Um, we have an article on how behavior analysts could support us. We have a treatment summary on, we, we have probably um, five or six dozen treatment summaries on behavior analysis, but the one we published in, in March was on elopement. But we also published something which we've never done before. We published something that had nothing to do with, it didn't include people with autism. It was typically developing kids learning how to uh, reject foods that they were allergic to because we wanted our readers to appreciate that in this tool chest of behavior analysis, there are interventions that haven't yet been applied to kids with autism, but bear relevance in case you think that ABA is only appropriate for autistic kids, you know, so we included that. Um, and um, we had an article on concerns about ABA um, and, and what we could do about those. So it's a great issue. So going back to your question, I, I, I don't want to be it's like a politician. I want to answer your question. So we do have this monthly issue. I'm just really proud of the fact that, you know, this issue for March 2024 was specific to behavior analysts. We have our website uh, and the website um, has a lot of great content on it, but we also have um, some sections for behavior analysts or parents of newly diagnosed kids, for parents of older kids, pediatricians, members of the media. Um, we have um, all of our Media Watch letters on the, um, on the website. And Media Watch is another thing that we do. And you know, I'm really um, proud of ASAP because um, responding to media misrepresentations of ABA is not something that our parent organizations have really done. And they needed to, and they didn't. Um, so our very first um, article was um, in 2006, and it was called A Tale of Two Schools. It was published by Time Magazine, and it compared um, an ABA center-based program in New Jersey with a program called Celebrate the Children. And it was all of these crazy comparisons, like, you know, at Celebrate the Children, the, um, the kids seemed so happy at this school, in this ABA school, um, Johnny had a nine inch binder. Like, and it just went back and forth and it was so in, unfair and inaccurate. Um, and that was the first letter that we re responded to. And since then, we've probably written about a hundred letters um, clarifying um, the behavior on a glitter treatment of autism. Um, so that's another thing that we do. I mean, we try to also celebrate uh, accurate media representations of autism and its treatment, um, but oftentimes we're sort of either refuting the information or saying, this is a great article, you might wanna consider th this or that, um, but that's something we've been doing for a while. We're really active on a couple of social media platforms, um, primarily um, Facebook and Instagram. And um, like we publish a fortune cookie every month that has some message like, 
um, you know, let the data speak, you know, or something that, you know, yeah. that behavior analysts would all, you know, appreciate. Um, and, um, we know, we also have um, an externship. So it's a 150 hour externship for people. Uh, we have um, high school students all the way through medical doctors and um, post, you know, PhD level behavior analysts who've been part of the externship. And we currently have about 10 externs and uh, it's a great group for people that want to, you know, learn more about dissemination or evaluating research or work on their writing skills or proofreading skills. So that's something that's been in place for about 10 years. So we do a lot. Um, and um, we're a largely volunteer group. I'm a, a halftime person. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, ASAT operates from my kitchen table. And, um, and we have a volunteer board, a volunteer professional advisory board. Our externs are fantastic. They write a large percentage of the articles month after month. Um, so um, we are uh, we're a tiny but mighty organization. Um, That's uh, incredible. Congratulations. Now, thank you. David, you briefly, you just brushed across this, but you said, you know, there's a section for behavior analysts. There is an incredible library for behavior analysts on all the articles that you have posted in the past. And I actually go there quite often and I will like, you know, look at an article or I need something in terms of, well, how do you do this? Or what does the research say on this? Sometimes instead of just going to Google and what does the research say, I'll go to ASAT first and I'll look oh, thank you. at the written only because it's in plain language. And if I'm trying to send it to a parent or if I'm trying to send it to, you know, an RBT or, you know, another professional who I want to train, looking at a daunting research article can be well, daunting. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. as a behavior analyst, go to that section, go to ASAT's website, check that out. And I'm not this isn't this is a plug for ASAT because I love it, but I have no affiliation with ASAT other than knowing you. Um, it's incredible. So their newsletter is fabulous as well. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it, it's funny you mentioned the research synopsis. We we developed um, a template on on all of them are structured the same way. So it's basically like, you know, what did the um, you know what was the the the, the topic. Uh, what do they do? What do they find? What does it mean? You know, what are the strengths and weaknesses? And we try to just distill it down to a paragraph, you know, and, um, and, you know, one of the themes that comes out from all of that is, um, you know, a lot of both behavior analytic and non-behavior analytic um, authors of research sometimes exaggerate the application of their findings. So we have to kind of wheel back a little bit and say, you know, these were all children that met seven prerequisite skills that do not necessarily represent the totality of, of the community of kids with autism. So we have to be careful and more research is needed to address nonverbal children with this intervention. So, um, you know, we try to really kind of help people have a more realistic understanding of what the research actually means. Yeah. Well, it really takes, you know, passion of people in the field to make change. So we're, we're grateful for that. Um, how can our, our viewers find you and support ASAT? Sure. Um, uh, uh, will we be able to include like some quick links yeah. at the end of the spot? Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll share you. I'll share that with you. But you know, we have, um, uh, they can subscribe to our newsletter, um, which is free. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of people ask us like, who are your, you know, your subscribers? And um, some of our parent board members a couple of years ago talked this into, reducing the response requirement for people to subscribe to make it as easy as possible. So we basically just know people's like name and where they're from. And we used to collect a lot more information, but we make it really easy for people to subscribe. Um, and uh, it is free and it comes out around the first of the month. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we have our website, esetonline.org, where we have the four um, platforms that we're on, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, Facebook and um, um, Twitter, uh, X now, X. Um, yeah, which is the one we use the least. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, you know, so we're, so we're, people could be active in, in that regard. In terms of how people can help us, um, you know, they could consider um, you know volunteering, uh, becoming an extern. Um, we are open to working with external writers. Um, there are some people on this call right now who are writing an article on choosing uh, data collection systems and another one on emotion re emotional regulation. Um, so people have written for us um, and, um, you know, we provide um, 
professional compassionate feedback. Um, and, um, you know, we have people who've written for us have often expressed or have written again for us. Um, so that's another way people can be involved. Um, you know, of course, donations, sponsors, um, you know, that's all wonderful as well. So there's there's a lot of ways that people can help. Um, and at the beginning of the year, we put together um, for our 26th anniversary, 26 ways that people could support ASAT. So I'll include that, you know, in the links uh, at the end of this podcast too. That's great. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, it was awesome just having you on and having a conversation and, you know, kind of a venting session too of like, oh, the field's changed, but not really. And then how do we disseminate PBA yeah. to our everybody out there, right? Well, yes. Thank you. Thank you. For thank being you here. both. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you.